you might recognize her from the Olympics. And her signature laugh. <laughs> or you might recognize her from a Call Me Maybe video. Or maybe it's from Carpool so Karaoke. There's probably down. one place you don't recognize her from. We'll tell you about that today during our conversation with Elizabeth Beisel. All right, so we have a very special treat for you today. Um, someone that you might not think would show up in a PMEA video, but we will get to that. We will explain um, why we have uh, an Olympic medalist with us today. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Beisel. If you, you may have seen her if you've watched the Olympics uh, for the past decade or so. You may recognize her, but there's one thing I guarantee you will recognize when you hear it, and that's her laugh, because if you've... <laughs> There it is. If, if uh, you've heard her interviewed at all, uh, it is definitely, uh, I would say, her trademark for sure. So, Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So, let's start. I want to talk about the swimming career um, okay. before we move into why you're really here. I guess we'll kind of tease people a little bit on that. So, give us kind of the intro. Who, who is Elizabeth Beisel in the swimming world, and, and who are you, basically? So, I... In the swimming world, I guess I've been on the U.S. national team since I was 13. I'm 25 now, so it's been about 12 years representing the United States. Um, I've been to three Olympics, the 2008, 2012, and 2016 Olympics. Um, I have two medals, a silver and a bronze, um, in the Fort Myers amateur backstroke. But I was born and raised in Rhode Island, um, pretty much a small-town girl who just absolutely loved the water. And my parents sort of threw me into the pool because I wasted all my energy that way. Um, but yeah, swimming's been an absolutely huge part of my life. Um, I got to be captain of the 2016 Olympic team, which was really, really cool, um, alongside Michael Phelps and Allison Schmidt and a couple of my other best friends. But it's been an incredible career. Um, I'm currently done, so I've retired swimming. Um, so right now I'm sort of just traveling the world and doing clinics and speaking and fun stuff that I couldn't really do while I was training. Um, so I'm making up for lost time in that sense. Sure, yeah, at 25, making up for yeah lost right. time traveling over time. the country and over the world. All right, let me, I have to ask, do you have the medals there with you by chance? I do, they're right here. Can we see them? See? I'm sure everyone asks you that question. Yeah, no, I do. And if we were in person, you could put them on. But so this is the silver. Awesome. I yeah, I can see it perfectly. And then there's the bronze. Awesome. Um, I'll give a little fun fact because okay. not many people know this about the medal. So this is Nike, the goddess of victory. I don't know if you can see her right there. She's on the face of every Olympic medal in the summer games. And then on the lip right here, I'm not so sure if you can see it, but there's writing and that's the event that you won your medal in. And then the back is always that design for that particular Olympics. So if you're like Michael Phelps and have 28 Olympic medals, you can determine which one is which. I don't have that problem. Um, but they are still pretty cool. They pretty much just sit in my room unless I'm bringing them to, you know, an appearance or something like that. But I mean, they're they're cool, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would say yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we talked a little about all this traveling you're doing. So you work for Speedo now, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. So you're doing clinics. Is that what you're doing around the country, around the world? Yeah, so I'm pretty much an ambassador for Speedo now. I used to be an athlete for them. Um, they were my main sponsor while I was still competing. Um, but I've continued that relationship through post-competition, and it's been phenomenal. I get to go to clubs. I get to go to companies speak on behalf of Speedo and, you know, my experience as an athlete. Um, so it's been really, really cool because it has brought me around the entire world, um, even past swimming. So I'm very, very lucky to be working with them still and, you know, representing an incredible brand that had supported me my entire career. So. And we'll put up your social media links, especially your Instagram page, because yeah. you're obviously a good photographer. You have an eye um, for what Thank you think. Thank but what's great is these these places that you're going. I mean, it's kind of like we all get to live vicariously through you as you uh, as you see the world. It's great. I'm very lucky. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, I would yeah. say so. I, as we're talking now here in the middle of April, you just got back from Ireland. And we're talking, you're traveling around the country a little bit more. And then you're going back overseas, which what a, how cool. It's great. I'm very lucky. Um, and swimming has given me that opportunity. So I'm very grateful to that. So... 
people are probably wondering what in the world are we talking to an Olympic athlete for? Very cool, right? Awesome, of course, a great story. But what does it have to do with music education? Well, um, if you if you Google Elizabeth's name, um, you will find uh, where I think I first heard about you and your musical career when a New York Times article. Um, and there were some pictures, uh, and so you're a musician on top of being a, a great athlete. So what instruments do you play? Where did this start? So honestly, my musical career started way before my swimming career. So it started when I was three years old. Um, I went to a friend's birthday party and they had a band there and there was a violinist and I was infatuated with the violinist. And so that Christmas, I asked my mom, I was like, I want a violin. Um, and so I got a violin when I was three years old, picked it up and fell in love. And then two years later, started playing piano. Um, I dabble in guitar a little bit. You know, I played oboe in middle school. So, I, you know, I've tried my hands at a bunch of things, but violin and piano are definitely my top two, violin number one. Um, but so I started taking lessons when I was three years old and... I really took to the violin. It's, it was always one of my strong talents that I had. And I, I always wanted to go to Juilliard. I wanted to be a violinist. Like that was what I wanted to do. I was the top violinist in Rhode Island, um, took private lessons until my senior year in high school. Um, you know, concert master for a bunch of orchestras within, you know, the community and stuff. And violin sort of had to take a back seat once I made the Olympics and started, you know, Com, you know, contributing all my time to swimming. And now that I'm done swimming, it's sort of like you and I connected and then it's just like, I want to get back into it. Um, because when you're training eight hours a day for the Olympics and you're wicked tired all the time, finding time to practice and set aside an hour or two to practice violin is pretty hard when I'm like so tired, I can't even like lift up my arms right. to play. Um, but so now that I'm done swimming, it's sort of been, on the back burner, trying to move it up to the front burner is, you know, a thing that I want to get back involved with. So it's been a huge part of my life. So I love this. I, I, we're going to go back and talk about your schooling part of this too, but I love this where you say, yeah, I, I want to go to Juilliard and I did all these things, but the Olympics kind of got in the way. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, you know, who can, who can make a statement like that in their life? That is, that's just amazing. Thank um, you. So let's go back. Uh, involved in school music, obviously. I mean, oboe, violin, so you kind of did everything. What, what was your school music experience like? So grew up, obviously, taking private lessons, but on top of that, I was in orchestra. I actually started playing oboe in elementary school, now that I'm, like, replaying my life. Um, that was elementary school, and it was sort of because they had too many violinists, and they knew that I could already play, so they were like, no one signed up for the oboe, so, like, will you please do this? <laughs> so I learned the oboe in about third grade, continued playing that until eighth grade. Um, but I was always in orchestra in middle school and high school, concertmaster all four years in high school. I was in Ocean State Youth Orchestra growing up, concertmaster of that, um, Rhode Island Symphony Orchestra, concertmaster of that. So, like, I've had experience doing that, but, and that was always my passion, but I had another passion for swimming. But so, I mean, school education was huge for me. I was in music theory classes all the time, you know, after school stuff, you know, doing music things with my friends. Um, sort of rare because you don't see that coming from an athlete. Um, but for me, I feel like music was my outlet that I had when I didn't want to be at the pool. And so even if I had a bad day at the pool, I could still, you know, crush a violin concerto or something, you know, with my friends and it didn't matter what happened in the pool that day. Um, so violin was honestly such a lifesaver for me. And, you know, the music, music ed education that I got out of it was amazing because music stays with you. And that's one thing that I love about it is that I can't swim competitively forever, not at an Olympic level. But violin, I'm only going to keep getting better at. And I can play the violin for the rest of my life. And I think that's something that most athletes have a hard time with is letting go of their sport. See, I can get let, let go and mm -hmm. still a violin right. and piano and guitar and all this stuff. So it's, it's really just such a blessing that I've been able to keep playing and I've had all the opportunities that I've had. And, and I, I want to be clear to people, this is, you're not just like, this is not a hobby. You are really good at this stuff. I've seen some yeah. videos. On, I've seen you sing. I've seen you play the guitar online. I mean, this, you're not just like, making this up as you go along. I mean, you know your stuff, and that's that's really impressive. 
for yeah, sure. I, it was my life, you know, yeah. so. Well, so it was your life, but how did you do that balance? How did you have that balance all through school of athletics and, and just time-wise? How did you make that happen? It was hard. So I was actually lucky for, you know, my swim club that I swam for. Normally you hear of kids doing doubles, which is the term for doing two practices per day. My team only did one practice a day, and that was at night. So what I would do is I would wake up sort of an hour earlier um, and practice violin and piano before school then go to school, then go to some practice, and then do my homework afterwards. And, I mean, I would be lying to you if I said that there were some days where I was like, I don't want to practice violin and piano today. Like, this sucks. I'm not waking up. But, you know, I had extremely supportive parents, and they were always like, if you don't want to get up, you don't need to get up. But I feel like every single time that I would miss a violin session or a piano session, I would regret it. And so I would always try to wake up early and practice. And, you know, I had to because I was in orchestra, so if I didn't learn the pieces and stuff, like, they would know. It's like swimming. If you skip practice, you're not going to be good. Right. If you right. don't practice your violin, you're not going to be well, and you're not going to be concert master anymore. And so for me, it was just, like, keeping myself honest. Um, and, and I think through swimming and music, I learned really good time management skills um, that I can carry along with me throughout the rest of my life. So. so where does it go from here? You said, you know, it was this kind of happenstance connection of how we, we came together. Um, and you, you want to, you want to get yourself, you know, let's, let's borrow a metaphor. You want to put your, your toe in the pool in the musical pool again. Um, so what, uh, uh, what, what are you thinking there? What's, what, what's next? Honestly, I don't, I don't really know. Like I would love to get into music education, obviously took, I don't know how many years of lessons and, you know, orchestra and music theory and stuff like that, but this is such a long shot, but maybe getting back into performing. Like I said, I just came back from Dublin. Um, I'm not a fiddler by any means, but, you know, just going into every single bar and pub and seeing the live music and the live fiddling going on, I was like, that would be awesome. And, and what a, like, similar outlet for me, you know, competing on a stage in front of people and then performing on a stage in front of people, you know, swimming and violin. Um, I guess have a lot of, a lot more similarities than people would think. And so honestly, I would do anything to get myself back involved with music, um, because it's been such a big part of my life. And now that I have more time to give, I would love to give that towards something that I have a passion for and that's violin and music in general. So, well, we're, I promise you, we're going to find a way to make that happen. Okay, perfect. Um, so l let me go back to that point, because it's interesting as you're saying that, you know, I think when I perform, there is that high that you kind of get when you're in a performance and it, you just played a part really well or your ensembles played really well. What is, how does that match up w to, uh, you know, when you jump in the pool and when you're you're at the Olympics or whatever it is? Is there is there a similarity there? A hundred percent. I remember, you know, doing solo and ensemble, which is just some like little competition in Rhode Island. You go in front of a panel of judges and they give you a score. And then if you get top 10, you get to go to that special concert, whatever. I remember I did that every single year up until senior year in high school. And my hands would be so sweaty before I got in. I would be almost, I would be as nervous as I was for the Olympics. And I think that's, it's a great outlet for me because Although the nerves are scary and overwhelming at times, I love that adrenaline rush. And you can't really get that through many things. And I think performing is something that you can get it from. But trust me, I mean, competing in the Olympics is really scary. But getting up and playing a violin piece in front of hundreds of people, or if you have a solo in your orchestra, it's, it's the same. And it's, and it's really hard. And I'm like wiping my hands on me, like hoping my fingers aren't going to slip. I like hold on to the bow. Um, but like, I love that. And I miss that. And I don't get that from swimming anymore. So I could maybe get it from violin now. I think uh, I, it was Parade Magazine or something. I saw this 25 things you don't know about Elizabeth Beisel. And one of them was almost what you just said there that, you know, it was more nerve wracking for you to get up with your violin in front of a group of 10 or 15 people than it was to stand up at the Olympics and dive into the pool in front of the world. De oh, definitely. And I feel like music was always something that I sort of kept to myself. Um, I didn't really tell the world about it in interviews and stuff. And I remember I, like there was a piano in our team room at the Olympics and I just sat down and started playing and somebody was like, you play the piano? And I was like, yeah, I play the violin too. And they were like, wait, 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 you're like actually good. And so the team manager for the Olympic team 
rented me a violin. And so that was like the first time that I had really played in front of all my teammates and stuff. And I, t- I'll tell you what, it was honestly so nerve wracking because these people, you know, I hold their opinions so high and I want to be good for them. And of course I don't play much anymore. So I'm like, Oh God, I'm going to sound so bad. You know, like I've been playing and I didn't have the music in front of me. So it's all from memorization, but it is nerve wracking. And I think, you know, for me to say that it's more nerve wracking than the Olympics definitely says something about that. Right. Right. Well, that's that. Okay. That's really interesting now. And so that's something, is there any video of that when you were at the Olympics? That would be just uh, amazing to see you playing in front of all these Olympic athletes. We I know. know, right? It was actually, I don't know if there is video. There was one team meeting that we had, um, and we weren't allowed to have phones in it, but Frank, the national team director, pulled me aside, and he was like, tomorrow night you're going to play the national anthem for the team. And I was like, what? Uh, I was like, I'd rather race in the Olympics right now than <laughs> play in front of the whole team. But it was such a cool moment because it was just the entire team and myself, and I played the national anthem. And, you know, if anybody watches the Olympics, you know the pinnacle of the entire Olympic Games is winning a medal and hearing your national anthem. You know, that's like our fight song. And so for me to – I get the chills, like, thinking about it. And just for me to do that in front of people like Michael Phelps and Katie Ledecky and having them hear me play violin, it's it's a cool part of my life that I don't really share with many people. So for them to see that was – Super huge. Right. Probably another reason why I was so nervous. <laughs> right, right. Well, yeah, I've seen a few times uh, on social media. You do share it with Allison Schmidt, known as Schmitty. Uh, yeah. When, when I, there's a there's a great video I saw. I think you guys were in Nashville, and uh, you're playing the guitar and singing, and she's holding up the phone for you. So it was team yeah. <laughs> teamwork there. She had the lyrics for me. That's she's great. a good friend. <laughs> Your manager, right? Yes, exactly. My band manager. Um, so let's go back to this whole idea of music versus athletics. And that's actually how we hear it so many times. Uh, when, when it comes to funding, when it comes to students' time, there is this, this, this I don't want to say fight, but there's this tension, I guess, of pulling between what's the better thing to do, music or athletics, and here you are an example of someone that can and has done both. Um, what's your message to maybe policymakers, decision makers, and probably more importantly, students uh, who find themselves in that position of wanting to be involved in both? I think one of the major things is that being educated is, educated is always number one. You know, I was always a student athlete, um, and for me, music is education. It's another language. It's a skill. It's something that you can use for your life. I mean, obviously being good at a sport is a skill, but it's not going to stay with you forever unless you're like a golfer and you get to golf until you're 80 and the master is like lucky you. But um, I do think that music education is so huge and it was such a balancer for me. You know, we put so many hours into athletics, but music is never stressed as much. And if I could do anything, it's to spread the message that music is something that will stay with you for the rest of your life. I cannot tell you how cool it is for me, you know, to just go to a hotel and see a piano in the lobby and start playing. And how many people look at me and they're like, that is so cool that you know how to do that. And I think that's always the reaction that I get. And it's like, well, you could have done this. You know, I did it. But it wasn't stressed as much as the athletics part were. You know, we always think of TV, all athletics and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, music might not get as much attention. But think about what you turn on when you hear the radio. and Or, like, what you hear on the radio when you turn it on and stuff like that. And music is such a huge industry. But I feel like the path isn't as clearly cut as an athletics path. And I would love to make that more of a clear-cut you know, popular path for people to take because I'm, I'm just so glad that I did it and sort of just fell into my lap because I went to a birthday party and liked the violin. Right. Um, but if I can use, you know, my medals right here as a platform to promote music education and playing instruments and stuff, that's, that means more to me than the medals themselves actually mean. So. Wow. I mean, that's amazing right there. Yeah. I mean, I, so you, you made some amazing points, but to a point that you said earlier that I also think speaks to it, you said, you know, you know you're know, you playing the national anthem here in a team meeting, and obviously that's kind of like your fight song, but you got chills as you were retelling the story. That speaks, I think, to the power of music for all of us, but especially a musician. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think music can definitely tell stories that cannot be told through just, you know, talking like this. It's just so beautiful and it should be a part of everybody's life at some point. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't possibly agree more. Um, we are glad to have you now on the music education bandwagon with us. Um, and we're going to keep bringing you in as much as possible. Sounds perfect to me. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, Elizabeth Beisel, again, thank you so much for talking with us. And I'm sure this is not the last time we'll be hearing from you uh, when it comes to music education. I hope not. Definitely not. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Again, thanks for joining us and uh, stay tuned. Who knows who we're going to talk to next?